All right. Hello, and welcome to the Middle East Forum Speaker Webinar Series. I'm Stacey McKenna, and I will be moderating this discussion today. We are pleased to have one of our Middle East Forum Writing Fellows, Dr. Asa from Romirowski, join us to discuss why the left turned on Israel and why it matters. Dr. Romirowski will speak for roughly five to 10 minutes, then open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to get to all questions, but we have quite a few participants on this webinar. So I apologize in advance if we do not get to yours today. And with that, I will turn the discussion over to Dr. Asaf Romirowski. Thank you, Stacey. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, I hope everybody is uh, safe and healthy wherever they are in these uh, unique times. And uh, I'm glad to hear that people are joining the call to uh, talk about some of the issues of the day, uh, even from our own homes and wherever we're located. So uh, again, thank you for the opportunity. Um, my topic this morning is really to, uh, this afternoon is to talk about uh, a little bit about where the left is at today as it relates to Israel. Uh, so I'd like to throw out a few points out there. I know we're short on time, and then we can go to uh, as many questions as we have. Uh, the phenomenon of what we're seeing today as it relates to uh, the lefts, and especially in, in more progressive circles, disengagement from Israel is not a new phenomenon. It's something that we have observed uh, throughout the American Jewish history's experience and throughout, Amer throughout Jewish history at large. Uh, but I will point, uh, and going back to um, the 1800s, uh, when you look at the creation by the reform movement of what would became known as the Pittsburgh Platform, where one of the uh, articles that was submitted back in the 1800s and 1885, to be exact, was the fact that Jews are no longer considered to be uh, and should not be considered to be a nation, uh, but rather a, a, a community and a member part uh, and, and don't have any kind of nation state aspirations. Uh, looking back at the history of the Zionist movement going back into later on to the creation of the Zionist Congress, actually this was part of the argument that Jews are indeed are a nation state. That mentality is important to point out to, just by way of historical reference, is exactly the narrative that the Arab Muslim world has argued for many, many years uh, in the pre-state era. That is that Jews are not a nation state and Jews are rather communities. And so when they were told to go to where they came from, they meant to become within the Muslim narrative a second class citizens and not having that nation state element. Uh, going, jumping a little bit further, you know, into historical from the, uh, where we are from that point into what took place uh, after the six day war, you did see a beginning of what I would consider to be uh, within Jewish circles uh, and within left circles, a, a phenomenon of what I would consider to be a replacement theology where you started to see a flip side of the reality of 1967, even though the state of Israel won uh, the Six Day War fair and square, you did see a detachment where there was a beginning, especially in American leftist circles, uh, a, and, and those who had Jewish individuals involved with them, a, uh, a sense that Jews are now considered to be the Goliath and the Palestinians are considered to be the David. That is the historical background to what leads to the contemporary modern day boycott movement that we see today materialize uh, in Mer many American college campuses uh, and in many circles at large within unions, churches and whatnot uh, within this framework um, that played out. It is important to note as it relates to 1967 and the 60s at large, it is, uh, it is critical to see that that phenomenon actually came out of a, directly out of a PLO playbook, understanding the fact that maybe we may not be able to defeat Israel militarily, but if we were to hijack what we call in the social sciences agents of, lim of influence, or uh, you know, as it relates to journalism, the academy and other areas, we'll be able to flip the narrative. And so you did see this growth of understanding of Israel as a conservative value that has been engendered 
and metastasize within these agents of influence or social change uh, tipping point organizations, specifically the academy, that allowed this narrative to grow. Further, um, when within these leftist circles, you've seen a growth of Jewish individuals who've made a point uh, of saying the fact that they are Jewish, but when, as it relates to Israel, the I'm Jewish, but narrative, so to speak, that has played into the conversation, detaching themselves, don't judge me based on my Israel or supposed Israel connection. I have none. I'm actually Jewish, but I am progressive. I am a lefty. Um, and this is where this growth, uh, what you see today, of an environment where social justice has really replaced and um, fed into these liberal progressive values. So historically speaking, if you look at, at large at uh, the voting record of American Jews and the American left, uh, you did see, you're, you're, you've seen this growth of uh, leftist values disconnecting between Israel. Israel, for to them, becomes a sense of guilt, a, sen uh, a blemish on their record, and they can no longer see themselves as real progressive values if they have the element of Israel within it. Now, if you take everything I'm saying in the short amount of time that I have here, uh, you know, we're trying to unpack some of these elements that played into the theological, political, and cultural narrative, if you look at what has happened today uh, within many circles within the Democratic Party, and referring to specifically into obviously the, the campaign that we're, the presidential campaign that we're currently in, you, you know, this makes a lot of sense of trying to understand how Israel has become removed from the Democratic Party. Uh, I hail from Pennsylvania. I remember when the DNC was here in Pennsylvania, uh, and you saw when the DNC was located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, you saw more pro-Palestinian flags than you saw American flags. Uh, you saw elements of trying to move away from the Israel part in order to say, I am not that kind of individual. And the fact that this level of Zionism that I see myself as part of is really, I am more connected to liberal values and that, you know, LGBTQ values, peace and conflict values that Israel does not project. And of course, the fact that um, in that myopic perspective, uh, the individuals, unfortunately, people like Benjamin Netanyahu have become the, um, they've become to encompass the totality of the state of Israel without actually understanding the fragmentation, even within the Jewish community at large. And so the individuals become, you know, these figure points, you know, as representing the right and only the sole right without actually becoming into uh, understanding what these values mean. The challenge has, of course, become that no matter how much the government of Israel has tried to showcase many of the liberal attributes that they have as far as human rights, freedom of the press, uh, LGBTQ, the pride parade takes place in Tel Aviv, uh, where people flock from all over the world. Uh, all these elements are, you know, are overshadowed by, of course, what I would consider to be the religion of the understanding of the, of the American left and the American Jewish left, is that, of course, is the occupation. The occupational narrative takes over at large, and no matter what the facts are on the ground, the occupation always wins the day as it relates to human rights abuses, no matter what. And the accusations against those who are supportive of Israel, of course, will say Israel is pinkwashing. So you can't be a liberal. You can't be a Zionist without being a warmonger. These are all the elements and all the attributes that are played out on social media that we see throughout the day. And it's a phenomenon that has, um, that has really uh, you know, fed into every element of the liberal aspect of the American Jewish community and liberalism at large. And so this is where you're seeing today a detachment where it used to be that Israel was and has been a bipartisan issue, that Israel was a key component of democratic issues going back to the days of Harry Truman, 
uh, they are no longer part uh, of the conversation in the sense that we used to be that, especially in the American Jewish identity perspective and within the American left, they were actually a building block of that identity. Today, the Israel has become a wedge issue, which is what you're seeing today metastasize and grow to this point today that you cannot be a Democrat or a progressive or a liberal without disengaging yourself from the state of Israel, which allows many of the individuals who are supporting the boycott movement, who many of them happen to be Jewish, to say that I am Jewish but which goes back to what I was saying earlier in my remarks to the Pittsburgh platform and to the elements of the progressive left that Jews are that you know Jews and the American left are looking to um, express themselves as open as liberal and to that end we cannot have anything related to Israel uh, blemish our record of progressiveness and of liberalism. Um, so I know that our time is short. So let me end there and let me open up. I see people are asking many questions. So I'll, uh, I'll open up the floor and we can go from there. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. We had quite a few questions coming in. Uh, first one, are there any on the left that are working against this and supporting Israel? And have, or have we lost the Democratic Party in general? Um, I would still say, you know, you know, if you look, if you look at the record of, you know, even, you know, the campaign, supposedly, you know, the fact that Sanders did not get the nomination uh, and Biden supposedly represents more of a centrist viewpoint, uh, though he has incorporated many of the progressive values, uh, that's more of a facade to me than I would say actual practicality. But I think that, um, there, there are no Scoop Jackson Democrats. There's no, uh, there's no Reagan Blue Dogs anymore in the Democratic Party. Uh, I mean, I think that, you know, the best example is when you're talking about individuals like uh, Ihan Omar and Rashida Tlaib, who, have, uh, who are freshmen, uh, but have basically taken over uh, the voices of the Democratic Party and the senior leadership uh, has not stood up, even though they should know better, I think is quite telling. You know, that was my last point. I think that Israel used to be uh, a, a, a bipartisan issue. I think the fact that we are losing that bipartisanship uh, as a result of these voices is concerning. Thank you. Along those lines, do you think Joe Biden is being influenced by this new left? Is he a danger to the Democratic Party? I think that he can't avoid it. I think that, you know, if he wants, uh, if he wants Sanders and, and Warren's endorsement and all these issues and where the Democratic Party is going, I mean, look, referring back to my earlier comment, uh, in that convention here in Philadelphia, uh, the pro-Israel language was taken out uh, of the Democratic platform. Uh, and I think that that is quite telling about where they are. They don't want to be judged based on their issues when it comes to Israel. Now, if you're looking at, you know, uh, the questions that were asked of the candidates through the debates as it relates to the actions that President Trump has taken regarding Jerusalem, uh, potential annexation, the Golan Heights, uh, there were very uh, concerning remarks coming out of the candidates saying that they may try to revert some of these issues. And I think that that's something that you will, um, you know, could happen, you know, we know, you know, obviously with Biden going forward or attempt to happen for that matter. Do you see this as permanent, or if not, what can or will reverse it? And uh, what can we do to change this narrative among Democrats? I think that, look, I, uh, there, to my mind, there, there's still you know, some element uh, of self-correctness, potentially. Uh, you know, you know, you know, if you're looking at how far left you need to be today to be a rank and file member of the Democratic Party, at some point there has to be a return, you know, the pendulum needs to swing a little bit backwards. Potentially, there's a way to, re, you know, revert back to some kind of basic elements that we can agree upon. I think that uh, the fact that you have, you know, kind of socialist Democrats, uh, you know, or, you know, for that matter, you know, Sanders is more like a, you know, kind of a, of a communist in many ways that the way he projected a lot of the views that he had um, weren't accepted all the way. And here we are, you know, with, with a Joe Biden, I think there's a potential of going you know, reminding individuals that the bipartisanship and the U.S.'s relationship is based uh, and was built on those kind of values. And I think that it should, Israel should not be a partisan issue, which is the direction we're going. And, we, and that's where we need to be doing a better job 
lobbying, arguing the issues, uh, finding common ground. Issues like anti-Semitism and BDS and Israel should not be, uh, to my mind, partisan issues. They should be bipartisan issues, and that's where we should be finding common ground. So specifically along those lines, how can Jews balance liberalism with Zionism? Uh, the founding fathers uh, of the state of Israel uh, were communists, socialists, uh, progressives, conservatives. I mean, they all found common ground. The only difference was, if you go, go back to the early founders uh, of the Zionist movement, even if you look at, at American uh, Zionists like Allah um, Silver and even people like Albert Einstein and others, uh, what you did see within their conversations and people even like Solomon Schechter who founded uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary, uh, you know, wherever they were on the political spectrum, they saw Israel as a building block in their Jewish identity. And I think that's what we've lost, at least, you know, going back, pinpointing the Six Day War over the past 50 plus years, uh, where that David and Goliath metaphor has totally shifted altogether. And that's where we need to remind ourselves that those values are indeed, could go hand in hand. There's no distinction between being a liberal and being um, a Zionist, uh, you know, unlike the zero sum game that is projected by Talib and Omar and others where you cannot be. And I think that that's, that's where that balance existed. Thank you. And Joshua Moravchik's making David into Goliath. He discussed the impact of the 1960s and 70s cultural changes in the U.S. How impactful was this time period in shaping the current narrative against Israel? Well, Josh's book was, you know, it's a highly recommended book, and Josh did a good job, you know, uh, you know, explaining that narrative. I think that 67 was indeed a, a, a critical tipping point, uh, not only in the academy, but also all over the place. It also allowed, uh, this is, you know, the Arab Muslim narrative, this is the one war that has been explained as a what is Israel as a war of choice, where Israel intentionally attacked the Arab world, and because of that, they create all the problems. As such, based on that narrative, it is their responsibility to solve the problem. And so, this is what has been adopted uh, within uh, you know American leftist circles, uh, you know, in particular, going in in the past fifty plus years. That is also what led to the academy being hijacked by many pro-Palestinian uh, Palestinian professors, Arab professors who have adopted that narrative in order to feed in and teach based on that narrative. And that's where you've seen uh, you know, the growth of Middle East studies and how they've been shaped as a result of that reality that they have um, projected post-1967 uh, to Josh's you know, book, per se. Hey. In addition to all the factors you named, do you think that the Israeli public's move from labor to Likud always played a role in the U.S.'s left turned away from Israel? Well, it's a fascinating point. It's a good question. I mean, the fact of the matter is that I would argue that really uh, since 1998, 1999, there's really not much left of the Israeli left. Uh, and the fascinating part is that the, the gap between left and right in Israel is much narrow between the gap between left and right here in the state. And that's what they don't understand. And, and I think that if you're looking at the reality today, even between Likud and blue and white or whatever's left of blue and white, you know, as far as Benny Gantz uh, within um, his own current party, it's really a, a debate between the right and the right of center. I mean, and that I think is part of the lost in translation that you see between the two sides of the Atlantic Ocean, between the Israeli narrative and the, and the left American Jewish narrative in particular, but in the left at large. And those gaps, uh, you know, again, you could find much more common ground between left and right or so-called left and right in Israel today that you can find between the left and right on these issues, you know, in, in the U.S. today. Thank you. All right. We have time for one last question. How does the left justify overriding the democratic values of Israel to promote and defend the corruption and oppression of, of Bata and Hamas? Again, I think that the fact that you have this growth of individuals like Talib, Omar, uh, you know, the kind of hard left uh, polarized viewpoints who are arguing that Israel is a human rights oppressor, the fact that, I mean, at, at the time when um, Sanders took on 
advisors like Linda Sarsour and others who are uh, anti-Semitic, pro-BDS individuals, uh, they're bringing in that, that narrative and they're willing to um, forego, excuse me, any kind of understanding of the reality on the ground to showcase their progressive values. And so for them, Hamas is, you know, are, are freedom fighters. Uh, you know, they're a charity organization. There is no understanding at all of the Islamist narrative whatsoever. Uh, and they have been managed to, um, to diminish any kind of understanding of what's been happening on the ground, which speaks again to the lost in translation between what is perceived and what is actually happening on the ground. All right, thank you so much again for taking time out of your day to speak with us. Uh, we have come to the close of our webinar. Thank you all for joining us today. There will be a short survey to fill out at the end to better help us serve you going forward. We'll be sending out our weekly webinar. Whoa, we already sent those out. <laughs> we will be sending out reminders for our upcoming webinars this week. Uh, on Wednesday, we have Cliff Smith and Sam Westrop joining us at 1 p.m. Eastern to speak on jamaat e islami a threat to Americans. Thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful day. Thank you for having me.